Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to the season one recap of The Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! We've got a lot of things that I want to touch on today, so let's not waste any time. Let's get right into it. First things first, top 10. The top 10 cards that I want to see printed from the Duel Monsters era. Obviously, we covered a lot of cards through season one of The Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! And now that I've got kind of a better perspective on what these cards offer, how they interact with the cards that we already have, I've kind of compiled a list of not only things that I personally want to see just from my favorite cards that we've covered in season one, but also just cards that I think would work fairly well in the metagame um, and just something that could actually be incorporated because a lot of them from the Duel Monsters era are so hyper specific. They've pretty much missed their chance entirely for being able to compete in the game it, to any level. So, number 10, Dark Wall of Wind. And this kind of goes against everything that I just said. It's strictly just for the meme of its card text in the anime that the player surrounds itself in darkness and can't be attacked directly for the turn. I just think it's really funny. Obviously they would change up the wording, but if they didn't, I'd be very happy to see that. Really not much else to say, it's really not that great of a card either. <laughs> Number 9, Atonic's Flame. Now this one is definitely more of a personal one because Alistair was one of my favorite characters, honestly, of Dual Monsters as a whole now that I've kind of looked back at everything. And the problem with this one is that although I want Atonic's Flame and I want all of Alistair's cards to be printed to the physical game, there's not a single deck that I play right now or that I would have any interest in picking up just to use Atonic's Flame. So it deals with Fire Fiend monsters. Really all you can do with that is Infernoids. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, some of Jack Atlas's cards, like the majority of his deck that aren't Synchros, are Fire Fiend monsters. So like the Resonator cards are all Fire Fiend monsters, I'm pretty sure. And then his mini sub-series of cards that have red in the name. So pretty much his red cards that aren't specifically Red Dragon Archfiend do technically work with this card. So I think that'd be something that I would possibly be interested in trying. But other than that, it's more so just a personal pick. I love Alistair. Would love to see his cards come to the game, so that is my number nine. Number eight, Turn Jump. Now this one is more so because I want to see what it could actually do in the meta or just in the physical game as a whole. It's really weird because we don't have anything like this except for charitably saying that something like Pyro Clock of Destiny is a watered down version of it. But other than that, from when I covered it originally, there was a lot of things that had me questioning exactly how this interacts with the rest of the game, not just cards on an individual basis, but the actual functionality of playing a duel. So where you, you're skipping each, you're technically running through your turns, but you're skipping the turns. Each phase still happens. So how does that entail, you know, effects? Does it negate effects that would activate during certain phases? Do those still go through, but everything else you're not doing? So it's just, there's a lot of questions that run through my mind that make me think that this will probably probably be a very degenerate card at the very least, which not to say that we need any more degenerate cards in this game, but still just an interesting one that is, when I first read it, I was like, wow, this is so out of the ordinary for anything that we actually have in the game. Number seven, Command Silencer. Honestly, I don't know what it is about this card. I think it's I think it's mainly just the artwork that I really like, but also the fact of it's it's a spell card. It's a quick play that negates uh, either attacks or the battle phase. I can't remember entirely which one it does, but it negates one of those two, and it's just interesting to see. I know we have a few cards out of the thousands that we have in the physical card pool that do essentially do this, but the draw one. I think the draw one is what puts it over the top, and that's why I do actually like the card because it's just something random. Surely a draw card, Exodia players will experiment with it in some way, shape, or form. Not as though we need any more of that, but... So yeah, it's kind of, there's not a whole lot else to, to say about it, really. Just Command Silencer. Good card. I approve. Alright, number six, Ninja Grandmaster Shogun. And only because Ninjas is one of my favorite decks of all time. Uh, probably top ten. So... I want all the cards that we saw from that weird guy that tried to like sex traffic Mai or something like that, whatever it was, it was super weird. But Ninja Grandmaster Shogun, I think kind of just encompasses the anime exclusive ninjas as a whole. I just thought they were really cool, something that I would want to try out in the ninja decks because they have some pretty neat interactions and they seem almost ahead of their time for what they were doing in the Duel Monsters era as far as just popping out so many monsters at once aside from like maybe 
Yugi using Multiply on Karibo, but that's not nowhere near the same as what the, the ninjas were doing in the anime. So I thought it was really cool. It was really advanced techniques for something that we would see so much later on in the game. So just a really cool thing. And I actually think that it would be pretty good to use in a regular modern ninja deck build. So something that I would just want to try. If it flopped, it flopped, but it'd still be a cool thing to see. Number five, easily the probably the normiest pick of the entire list for me, but who cares? Junk Dealer, I mean, it's a great card. If you run machine decks, if you run a warrior deck, it is insane. I don't think Junk Dealer really needs any further explanation as to why it'd be so cracked in the meta, even going into today, especially, because that's, that's a problem with a lot of these cards is that, like I said before, they've kind of missed their opportunity to be competitive just because they rely on the game being so slow because they're from the Duel Monsters era, but something like this would actually still be pretty viable, maybe not a, a tier one threat or go into any tier one decks, but definitely something like rogue status. I could see rogue decks doing something really crazy like this. Uh, maybe Cyber Dragons would do something cool. I know that I would love to play it in just my warrior deck, so. Just a, just a personal fan favorite pick, I think, as a whole for a lot of the Duel Monsters era cards. And then, of course, it's an Alistair card. You're not going to see me complaining about that, getting a front row in the, uh, in the printing line for anime exclusives. Getting into the top four, Reclamba the Spirit King. So, this one, um, I didn't realize was so crazy when I covered the Virtual World arc. That was one of my least favorite arcs of the entire Duel Monsters era, so... I guess you can't you can't really blame me for not remembering that it was uh, a good card, so to speak. But I think I kind of my same sentiments from that video, from covering that arc in the series, is the same as it is now. I would really want to see what this card could do, and I think that kind of goes for every card that I would put on a list like this, even going above a top ten. I think I would just really want to see how some of these. Very unique cards compared to the entire pool of anime exclusive dual monster cards would actually compete in, you know, today's meta. So I think Ruklamba just kind of perfectly encompasses that, is that it's got a very unique ability. It's not something that relies on the game being slow necessarily, but it's just a good card overall. It's a good card overall. What can I say? All right. Number three is a big one played by Kaiba, Clone Dragon. This one is just perfect. It screams modern meta, and like today's modern meta. Not Duel Monsters meta, but today's modern meta. 2024, Clone Dragon. So it's just, it's just generic. I always vouch for generic cards. i not a fan of archetypes. Okay, Boomer. But I really like generic cards like this, that although it's obviously a Kaiba card, it doesn't have to go in a Blue Eyes deck. It doesn't have to go in whatever other archetype he gets from his monsters. It's... It's generic. You can throw it in anywhere. It usually, it sounds like it'd be pretty good. I would be definitely trying it in my decks, personally. Number two. Number two, Underworld Circle. I still am shook to the core from how just insane Underworld Circle is. I've never in my days, I mean, honestly, never in my days have I seen a car just this freaking ridiculous. But... This was originally going to be number one until I re-looked at my list and realized that someone else just nicked it out, probably for all the wrong reasons. But Underworld Circle is just insane. And I would really want to see this go into a tier one deck and just wreak havoc. Because this, I mean, I don't know. There's not much else you can say. It's just ridiculous, insane, probably toxic. Probably toxic is the best word for this card, but yeah. Underworld Circle, number two. And the big number one, the big number one. Again, it's probably here for all the wrong reasons, but it's Heavy Metal King. From This is a day one. Heavy Metal King is a day one card for me. Ever since I saw this card in the anime, I thought it was in the physical game. Turns out it wasn't. <laughs> Fast forward 20 years later, it's still not in the game. Why don't we have this card? Why wasn't it put along with the new Metal Morph support? Why, Konami? Why do we fumble the ball like that? Shame on you. But again, it's just a nostalgic card, but it honestly, it had to be number one. This has been, again, a day one that I've wanted to see come from the anime to the physical game ever since I saw it as a child. It's still not here. I'm still waiting on bated breath. Maybe we'll see it with the new Metal Morph, Metal Morph support if we, if we get more, I guess. But I don't know. So yeah, number one, 
without a doubt, Heavy Metal King. Moving away from a top 10, I think a big question that comes up when we talk about anime exclusive cards, no matter what era they come from, is how do we actually incorporate these cards into the game? How do we import them? Because I am so tired of seeing singular cards that were once exclusive to the anime now become somewhat of a loose selling point for a set. I hate seeing single cards, especially from Duel Monsters, finally make their way into a, what, now we're in a technically Rush Duel era set. Not that, you know, we're playing Rush Duel, but we're just, we're well past the original, the original animes and everything. We are essentially in the Rush Duel era of the game. So, what I've discovered is that over the course of season one, we have covered a total of 289 cards. That being said, think about the Megatins. This year's, last year's, you know, the years prior, whatever. Basically when they had their own dedicated set for Megatins. 289 cards isn't very much of a stretch beyond what the Megatins have done. So I think that this year the Dueling Heroes tins was like 274 cards. The year before that I think was 265. And then the three years prior to that were about like 250 or so. Like they were right around the same range. So 289 cards isn't really that much of a stretch to say put into a Megatin. So what I thought was an Animation Chronicles Megatin. In addition to like the regular Megatin that we would get that has all of our reprints that we need and all that good stuff, but it, an Animation Chronicles dedicated Megatin for the year. That'd be great because what can we do? We can put all 289 cards into that one tin. Now we're, now we're caught up with Duel Monsters all of a sudden. Slow down, killer, I know. Big brain stuff. But that would be what I think would do, like, the most justice for everything. And especially because it gives the chance to just kind of funnel them all through. They're all here. And then we can kind of see how certain cards would be reworked. And that kind of brings up another, I guess, talking point, so to speak, is that obviously certain cards that we saw, say, like, Quick Attack, for example, was specific to the anime because Duelist Kingdom Arc, Virtual World Arc, and then I don't think they did it after that, the Fusion Monsters had Summoning Sickness for some reason. I don't know why I don't remember that ever happening, but I guess it did. So cards like that were specifically designed with those effects in mind. So we'd have to see how we're going to basically rework them, which it to a point makes it just not the same card anymore which i think also works in favor of a megaton for an animation chronicle style of set just because if we can taper that down back closer towards at least you know what dueling heroes did with 274 i don't know how much or how many cards uh dueling mirrors is going to have but i mean if it's closer to 289 then we really don't need to cut down cards so yeah, I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but so yeah, Mega Ten Animation Chronicles massive set Dual Monsters era is covered. I think it's a great idea. Let me know what you guys think. Let me know what you guys would want to do for importing these cards that not that's not just one random card that is everyone gets hyped up about. All right, now we're gonna get into some questions and answers from you guys, the viewers. Thank you all so much for your questions. I think we've got like six or seven that we're doing today. So a nice little, a nice little bundle. So thank you guys for your questions. Let's get right to them. Orange Cross 76 says and asks, the series is great. Thank you so much. I'm not really sure what I would improve on since you cover everything pretty comprehensively. I appreciate that. Uh, first of all, thank you. Because there's obviously been some episodes where I've either had misinformation or uh, missed cards from certain series so you know I appreciate that I try to collectively get everything as tight as possible and there's some improvements that I want to make on that front going into next season just because this season was in my mind okay just in my mind a mess as far as you know how I distributed the cards and how I wanted to do certain things but I appreciate the kind words in terms of a question, some properties have had brand tie-ins with Yu-Gi-Oh, such as the Potato Chip cards and Power Pros. If you haven't seen the Lost Yu-Gi-Oh card uh, 
series that I've done. I've done a couple of episodes now. Go check that out. Uh, really fun stuff that we're doing there. What's a brand or external property that you would most like to have an archetype based on? Okay. Uh, great question, first of all. Thank you. So, I don't know if you guys can see certain things up here, but you'll probably notice that there are three different Iron Giant freaking toys here. Iron Giant is one of my favorite movies of all time. Mainly from when I was a kid, but it's, it still holds up today. It's a pretty dang great movie. I've always thought that Ancient Gear Golem kind of looked like an upgraded form of the Iron Giant, but since I don't think that it's technically inspired from that, what I would want to see is an archetype based on the Iron Giant. Something something that maybe like directly counters against Ancient Gears. I think that would be kind of cool just to have these big robot archetypes clashing. I think that would be pretty cool. Um, as far as anything else, I'm not really sure. I think if I had to go off of maybe like video games that I enjoy, because I think that would just be like the next logical step. We already have something for Resident Evil, which is, you know, one of my favorite games. Maybe something like, I don't know, because I know Vendred is technically based on Resident Evil, but maybe something like more, more drilled into like the Resident Evil lore, if you could do that, I guess. But if I had to go on like number two, if we could do something based on Hitman, that'd be cool. That'd be really cool. I would love to see an archetype based off the Hitman game series. So yeah, I think, yeah, Iron Giant and Hitman. Those are my answers, but good question. Next up, Ren. Suzugamori, 1427. If you want any cards to make it to the real game from Dark Duel Stories, that was one of the one of the last couple of episodes that we did for the season one. What effects would you give them? Uh, me personally, I'm a big proponent for just generic cards overall. Very generic cards that can work with anything. So, even though I think like the most logical thing is that most of Dark Duel Stories cards are going to be turned into illusion monsters. If we can, by chance, just make them, like, really good generic type supporting, maybe not necessarily attribute support, but I guess we could incorporate both. It's just really good, solid, generic type and attribute support that can be thrown into whatever nonsense deck they put out that is tier one, you know, tomorrow or whatever. Just, yeah, I just want to see good generic effects that can really be thrown into anything, or if they maybe do some archetypal stuff with it. Like, I know that when we covered the Dark Duel story stuff, um, I think it was the Ice archetype, just because there were three monsters and one that I added that had, like, Ice in the name. Maybe do something with that. If we can tie some stuff into archetypes that, you know, makes sense, I think that'd be cool. Maybe still keep the ridiculous uh, attribute and type matches that they did, because I... I think that was kind of a, a charming little quirk for Dark Duel Stories, with that, is that it was so random, it made no sense, but I think that maybe you could do something with that. I don't know, I'd, I'm sure there's something there that'd be cool, but me personally, just, you know, make them generic supporting cards that could go into anything. Rubens Fabulet, I hope that I'm pronouncing that right, 5133. Did you not put the Yu-Gi-Oh! R cards in the Duel Monster season because you will lump all the Yu-Gi-Oh! spin-off mangas together in the future, or did you just forget that R existed? Uh, luckily I have not forgotten that Yu-Gi-Oh! R existed. When it comes to the manga cards, the manga exclusive Yu-Gi-Oh! cards, I... At least right now, I'm not going to incorporate them into the Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! I will do some videos on them for sure, but I don't think that they're going to be incorporated into this series, and they're definitely not going to get their own series, at least at least right now, because I still want to focus on the Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! just because of the plans that I have for it going forward and how I want to improve on it, so I don't want to tack on another weekly series just yet. So that's kind of your answer. So I, I haven't forgot about it. Videos will be coming on them soon, and I think Yu-Gi-Oh! R is probably going to get its own dedicated video, so I guess stay tuned for that, if that made sense. Thanks for the question. Next up is Nick Casillas. Again, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. 1618. How far are you willing to take this? Past GX, a lot of the cards become super specific and archetype focused, especially in Arc 5 and Zexel. So, as far as how far I'm willing to take this, uh, all the way to the end, baby. We're we are going to cover every era of the anime. 
Rush Duel, as far right now, Rush Duel right now, I am not covering. Of course, that is going to be way further down the road because we still have GX 5Ds, uh, Arc 5, Zexel, Brains. We still have all that stuff to cover, so we'll, we'll worry about Rush Duel when we get to it. But I'm going to take it all the way to the end. I want to cover every single card that is still anime exclusive. As far as going into how hyper specific that they get, I think that's actually a good thing for me. One of my biggest gripes that I have about how I handled season one is that uh, up until maybe like the midway point or like towards the tail end of uh, season one, I didn't know what I was doing <laughs> as far as grouping cards together. I think like when I did the Duelist Kingdom episode, the legitimate, like, the official first episode of The Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! That just made sense to me. It's season one, episode one, let's cover season one of the game, of the, the series of the era with Duelist Kingdom. It just made sense in my mind, but going forward, I was like, how do I actually want to divide this up? Because I wasn't thinking in my mind of like, okay, we could do Duelist Kingdom, Battle City, Virtual World, Waking the Dragons, Grand Championship. In retrospect, that would have made a lot more sense, but the season would have been a lot shorter. I would like each season to be, if I can manage it, 10 to like 15 or so episodes. And just like I did with Spidey from Underground on the season finale, I would like to incorporate some kind of special guest on each season finale episode. I think that'd just be a cool thing to look forward to as the season kind of progresses. But going back to this, I think that because they are so archetype focused and specific, meaning they basically retain to a certain character, especially as we go forward, it'll make it a little bit easier for me to divide them into certain episodes. So like, Spoiler, episode one of season two is going to be Chaz Princeton, so I hope you guys are ready to Chaz it up. But that's more or less what I want to do with season two, for GX at least, is that we're going into each character just from how I've compiled the list of all the GX cards. There's like over 400, so we're covering twice as many cards, but the large majority of them are focused on the individual characters so each character is basically going to get its own episode some duelists are being paired together because they either don't have enough cards to make like a, a legitimate episode in my mind or they kind of like group together like one that i'm planning right now is the uh the duelists of dark world so like when all of our main protagonist team had to fight like the dark world monsters i'm not super familiar with gx either that's kind of the problem <laughs> going forward is that when I look at all these seasons is I'm like well I'm not incredibly familiar with what the meta looked like at the time so like I can still only look at it from today's perspective of how would these work today I can't I won't really have much of an input on how they would have performed potentially in their time that they should have been released so to speak so once again I'm going off on a tangent but yeah, I, it, overall, it makes it easier for me as far as grouping everything together because it is so specific. Great question. Made me, made me think. A lot. Tyler McCann, 848. What is your most unhinged conspiracy theory as to why these cards remain anime exclusives? Okay. So not necessarily a conspiracy theory, but just the downright facts. So what actually happened... There were never supposed to be any anime exclusive cards. The cards that we see that have never been printed into the physical game slip through the cracks of the production of the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime. As we see one, two, three cards at a time transition from the anime to the physical card game, it's because we're stuck in a time loop. They are just now finding out that these cards were in the anime this whole time. But they weren't aware of it. They are just finding out, 20 years later, that these cards were seen by public eyes. They were never meant to be seen. Because they were given strict instructions on what to do with the anime, and that it was only to include the cards of the physical Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game. But dare I say, those rebels created some great work sort of i guess it's hot in here all right and our last question comes from dragon card gamer thank you so much for commenting 
with Diamond Head Dragon being bad, what would you like to do to improve it? So, for those who don't remember, Diamond Head Dragon was one of the many non-ritual, but might as well be a ritual monster from the Duel Monsters era of the series. Let's see, it was played by Rebecca Hawkins, and I, th I think Duke Devlin had it at one point. I don't remember him playing it, but I know Rebecca Hawkins did. Either way. What I would do is take away the ritual summoning clause on an effect monster. Uh, that's about it. I mean, honestly, just make it a normal monster. Make it like Luster Dragon number two. And it'll probably be just fine. Honestly. Good question. Good question. All right, that's the end of season one. That's the recap. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Okay, so, well, I'm not kidding. That is the end of it. Drop your comments down below. Uh, let me know your top tens. What what cards do you guys want to see of the 289 cards that we've covered in Season 1? Granted, that does include tokens. I forgot to mention that earlier. That does include tokens. Whatever. Let me know what cards you want to see. Well, hope you guys are looking forward to Season 2 uh, premiering next Friday. Chaz Princeton, get ready to Chaz it up. I hope you guys are ready to get your game on because we're covering the secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. I still need to record an intro for Season 2. I'm going to get on that. If you like the video, don't forget to show that like button some love. It's greatly appreciated. As always, guys, pushes the videos out to the world and to the YouTube algorithm in space. Something I never do is if you like content like this, if you like the series, don't forget to subscribe as well. Uh, we're kind of steadily climbing up. I really I appreciate the support that you guys have shown me thus far. I'm still pretty new to the YouTube sphere, so it's been a fun ride so far. Let's keep it going. And until next time. This has been Purple Pineapple TV, signing off.